Good day, grade 12 learners. Welcome to today's business studies lesson. My name is Tiri Sotlaka. This lesson is brought to you by Gauden Department of Education in collaboration with Saibono Discovery Center, broadcast by Pagama Research and Development. Today we look into grade 12 revision program and the main topic we look into is the business operations. And the subtopic we look into is the human resources and this will be assessed in your paper one. Now let us look into our learning objectives. We have human resource activities which guide our learning outcomes or objectives. We looked into recruitment procedure last time. We looked into the selection activity in the previous lesson. Now we'll be looking into induction and we'll look into placement together with the salary determination. We'll look into the fringe benefits and we'll look into legislation and on how legislation now implicates the human resources. Now, we have our pre-knowledge. This is what we covered in our previous lesson. In our previous lesson, we looked into the recruitment procedure under the activity recruitment. We also looked into job analysis, which consists of uh, job description and specification. We looked into methods of recruitment. We also looked into sources of internal uh, recruitment and sources of external. We also looked into the impact and then we further looked into the selection activity where we discussed the following, the selection procedure. We also looked into screening as part and parcel of the selection and then we also looked into the purpose of the interview. We looked into the role of the interviewer before the interview and during the interview. We also looked into the role of the interviewee to say what is the role of the interviewee during. Remember the role of the interviewee only occurs during the interview. We also looked into the meaning of an employment contract together with the content of employment contract to say what should be in the contract. Then we looked into legalities of an employment contract to say for a contract now to be legal, what should be there? And then we looked into the last part of selection activity, which was termination of employment contract. Now we will be looking into induction to say now, since we looked into recruitment, which is a process of attracting a suitable candidate, and we analyzed the impact of using internal or external, and also looked into differentiating between job description and specification, now we look into induction because after the recruitment, we select who's the suitable candidate. And then after the selection has been done, now we have the new employee. That's where now induction comes in. With induction, we will be looking into the meaning of induction. We will also look into the purpose of induction to say what is the purpose, what is the aim, uh, what is the business aiming to achieve when they do induction. We we'll look into aspects that are in the induction program and we we'll look into benefits of induction to say how does the business benefit from doing the induction or from introducing the employee. Now let us look into the term or the meaning of induction. What do we mean with induction? Induction basically is when new employees are familiarized with their new physical working environment or organizational culture or they are being familiarized with the products or services that are being offered by the business. And then we, we further define it as when new employees are being informed about the processes or procedures of the business to say how does the business make their products, how does the business make their profits. So uh, the new employee has to be informed so that they know how it is to be done. So the induction program is basically done to introduce a new employee after they've been appointed. Remember, we started with the recruitment activity. Then we looked into selection whereby we focus on selecting the suitable candidate. Hence, we perform the interview. Hence, we looked into the role of the interviewer and interviewee. Remember, the purpose of an interview is to make the employee or to select an, a, a candidate who's suitable for the job. Now, after we have selected that suitable uh, uh, candidate, now they are the new employee. Hence, the term here is no longer candidate, but it talks to 
new employees, new employees because they were selected because of their suitability, because of their skills. Now we are introducing them to their physical work environment where they'll be working. We are introducing them to the culture of the business. We are showing them how the products and services are being uh, made. And then we are also informing them about the processes and procedures of the business. And then with the meaning of induction, we also look into making sure that new employees should have the basic knowledge of what is expected in the job. Or it can be an issue of making sure that the new employee understands his or her role or responsibilities in the new job. So that is the role of induction, to introduce the new employee, maybe to their fellow colleagues after they've been employed but also maybe to inform them about how to deal with safety when they are inside the organization. And in short, maybe you give them tips or information about how the organization runs. So that is the meaning of induction. Let us look into the purpose. What is the aim? What is the business aiming to achieve when they do induction? One, the, the purpose of induction is to introduce employees to management or colleagues to establish relationships with fellow colleagues at different levels. That's one purpose, is to make sure that the new employee now will know who's management and will know who's their close colleagues so that they are able to establish what a relationship before they can start working. Furthermore, is to give the new employees a tour or information about the layout of the building or office. You also give them a tour about the layout of the building so that they know where what is situated inside the business. So you are basically giving them a tour inside the organization, taking them to toilets, showing them where they should go if they are looking for toilets, showing them where they should go when they are looking for canteens, showing them where to go if they want to have lunch. So that is basically a, a basic layout of the structure or the organization or the the layout of the business and then you also make the new employee feel welcome by introducing them to their physical workspace it's also part and parcel of now the purpose of induction you make them feel welcome by introducing them to their physical workspace this can be their office this can be a, a place where they'll be working so you introduce them to that place as well you also ensure that during or the purpose again of induction is to improve their skills through in service training maybe they are trained about how to get access to maybe the computer how to upload if maybe they'll be on an IT position or they'll be using the computer frequently so you train them on such furthermore familiarize the new employee with their general organizational structure or their supervisors so they should understand the structure of the business they should know who's their authoritarian who's their boss so that they know where to report if they have problems so that is the organizational structure remember with organizational structure some businesses have some uh, maybe they have a ceo here then they have the functional managers maybe this is a public uh, public relation this is marketing so that's what we mean with the organizational structure this is finance this is purchasing so this is marketing and maybe we can also add admin so the the, the new employee should know the organizational structure in terms of who has authority who they can report to if they have problems. That's what we mean with the organizational structure. And then allow, again, the new employee to an opportunity to ask questions that will put them at ease or reduce insecurity, anxiety, or fear. That is the purpose. Now, aspects that should be included in the induction program, in this program that introduces a new employee, what should we see? What should be in this program? This program should include introducing the new employee to key people or immediate colleagues. Furthermore, it should include safety regulations and rules to say if the business catches or the building catches fire, where wh what do you do? or where do you go furthermore it should also include the overview of the business and it should include the tour of the premises so that they know where the toilets where the restrooms and so forth 
Furthermore, it should include the discussion of the employment contract and conditions of services. And it should also include discussing the employee's benefits to say what are the benefits. And then it should also include information about the business products or services that are being offered. So this is what can be included in the induction program. Remember, it cannot take one day. Sometimes it can take one day if the business is small. But if the business is big and well established, then it can take up to five days whereby they address each issue per day. So that is the purpose. Remember, uh, aspects that can be included there. One is to ensure that we discuss contracts. We ensure that we uh, give an overview about now safety regulations and rules inside the business and introduce the new employee to their immediate colleagues and also give them a tour of the premises. Now, what are the benefits? Remember, we looked into the purpose to say, why is the business doing it? And then we looked into aspects that should be included in the induction program which focuses now on what uh, on the idea that what would be in the program but with the benefits we're saying how will the business now get the advantage after they have introduced the new employee the advantage would be it increases the quality performance or productivity of the new employee because they know where to report and who to talk to if they need uh, any help Furthermore, it allows the new employee to settle in quickly and work effectively. This is the advantage because if the new employee is introduced, they will settle quicker. Hence, because they shall have established what? The relationships with their particular new employees. And then it also ensures that employees understand the rules and restrictions in the business. Furthermore, it allows the new employee it allows the new employee to establish relationships with fellow employees at different levels, which also contributes to the new employee settling in quickly. And then the new employee, again, the employee will be familiar with the organizational structure, e.g. who is their supervisor or their low-level manager if they want to report something. And then it makes the new employee feel at ease in the workplace which reduces anxiety or insecurity or fear that is the benefits the advantages of doing what induction for the business it increases the quality of performance of the worker two it makes the worker settle quicker and work effectively because they know about the business they've been educated about the business they were introduced because part of the introduction is educating them about what the business does and then it makes the new employee to understand the rules and restrictions of the business which we can also take to be the code of conduct and then the new employee may establish relationships with fellow employees at different levels so that is the benefit. Think about it if you were uh, recently employed in KFC, they need to induct you. If you'll be working in the kitchen and you'll be frying the chicken, you need to be taught how you should do it. And if you have mastered the skills after the induction, definitely you are going to increase the quality of performance by making sure that you make the fried chicken that is of good quality so hence we say it improves the quality performance of the employee and you will settle quicker with the people you'll be working with if you have already established a relationship with them during the induction program so those are the benefits of induction now we look into placement now placement will be looking into the meaning of placement we will look into the placement procedure and we will look into the importance of skills development now with placement after you are introduced, now you have to be placed. Remember, during the induction, you are actually not working. You are being educated about the structure of the business, the overview of the business. You are given information about how the business or services are being conducted. But then when we look now into placement, this is where you are going to be placed in your office where you'll be working, in your kitchen if you are the chef, in your classroom if you are a teacher, and then we want you now to start working. Now let us look into the meaning of placement. Selected candidates are placed where they will function optimally and add value to the business. I will give you the examples again. Induction, you were introduced, you were not working. 
you have been told where to get what and you have been introduced to your colleagues but during the placement now the candidate as it says is placed where they will function optimally so if you are a teacher for instance your induction can be being introduced to the classes you will be teaching being told how many classes you'll be teaching being given your timetable being told what is the code of conduct of the school however when you are now being placed we are saying you're going to be taken to your classroom and be given classes to say now is time to teach and you should be given classes that will make you or help you or you should be given classes that would basically be subjects that you will function optimally when you are teaching so that is placement this is when you start working now so wherever you will be placed it should be a position where you will function optimally and add value to the business so when we say you will function optimally it means now you are going to do your best because you will be placed in a position where you have the skills and capabilities to perform the duties that are required by the position and then as we proceed a specific job is assigned to a selected candidate so during the placement, a specific job is assigned. A position is given to you. If you are a soccer player, a position to say you will play right back, you are a striker, your role is to score. But then with induction, remember, you are being trained to say uh, this is how we want the striker of the team to play. But with now placement, we are saying this is a game situation. These are the opponents. Go there, score goals. So that is the example of placement uh, 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 with chefs as well in a restaurant they will be taught to say okay now during the induction this is how we want you to cook this is what we want you to do uh, and but then now when we are saying placement we are saying this is your stove this is what we want you to prepare for us then the qualifications skills or personalities of the selected candidate are being matched with the requirements of the job so hence you have to be placed in a position where you will function optimal because your skills your personalities have to be matched with the requirements of the job for instance let's say you are given a, a sales manager job or a sales uh, person job it means you are, you are the one who has to sell the product or the services to customers you cannot be placed to a position of a sales uh, person if you cannot talk to customers so if you fail now to talk to customers it means your the, the business did an incorrect placement because the qualification skills and personality does not match the position or the requirements of the position so that is placement the position and your skills personalities need to match so that you function optimally let us look into now the the, the issue of looking into the procedure to say how is this placement done employers should outline responsibilities or expectations of the the uh, employee in the new position so the employer would be giving you guidelines to say this is what we need from you we need you to sell maybe 500 products per month we need you to speak to the customers with respect so that is now when you are being placed in the position before you start working, your expectations or responsibilities are given to you. Expectations that you need to sell 500 units of products. So the employer would give the information to the employee in the new position. Now, Part of the procedure now is to say the employer should determine the relationship or similarities between the expectations of the position and the competency of the 
employee. As we said, if you are selling, you have to interact with the customers. You need to talk with the customers. So if you can talk, if you can convince them to buy the product, it means now you will not be able to meet the requirements of the position which says you should sell 500 products. So now the expectations of the positions and the competencies of the employee would not match because as I said, if you are in sales, you are basically talking to the customers directly. You are the one who has to convince the customers. So the relationship between the two has to match. So it's part and parcel now of the role of the employer when they are doing the placement procedure to determine the relationship between the position. The position requires someone who can talk to customers so that they buy 500 items. And then it means the competency, the personality should be personality that attracts uh, the customers, that makes customers to want to buy. So that is placement. And then the employer again has to determine employee strengths, weaknesses, skills, or interests by subjecting him to various psychometric tests. So this employee again would be subjected to psychometric tests just to check their abilities, their strengths, weaknesses, and interests so that if they determine their strengths, they will be able to give direction on which position will better suit them. So that's what we mean with placement. It would be done or the procedure would be done for that purpose to check, to match the abilities or competencies of the worker with the requirements of the job. Hence, when it starts, the employer has to outline the responsibilities and expectations, then determine the relationship between the expectations of the position and the competency of the employer. Furthermore, determine the strengths and weaknesses, skills and interests by subjecting the worker to psychometric tests. However, if the placement didn't go well, we have the importance of training development in human resource management to say, let's train now this worker because this worker lacks some skills that are needed for the position so that the worker can perform optimally. So why is it important to do training development in HR? management the employee who receives necessary training is more able to perform in their job because now they have the what the skills they've been upgraded so they'll be able to perform in their job and they'll be able to be productive what do we mean with productivity productivity is when you are able to produce a lot of products using less resources furthermore the investment in training that a company makes shows employees that they are valued, meaning they are valued, they are being appreciated for what they are doing. And then another uh, importance of training development is that an effective training program would allow employees to strengthen their skills. It means if you already have a skill in a particular uh, uh, ability or discipline, you will be able to uh, have stronger uh, uh, skills or capabilities in that particular aspect. If it is computer literacy, you'll be better, you'll know new things, new tricks, and you'll be able to cope with new technology if it comes up because already you are being trained and training will be based on new skills or new information or new systems that are in place at that time. And then another importance of training is that productivity usually increases when the human resource function implements the training courses because workers will work very fast and produce a lot of products without wasting the raw material or resources. And an ongoing training and upskilling of the workforce will encourage now creativity because employees will be able to come up with new ways to deal with uh, new challenges so it allows creativity to to be implemented because if you have new skills you find now new ways to do things so that is the importance of training development in hr now we look into an activity 
Read the scenario below and answer questions that follow. We have to miss induction program now. You have to read the scenario and understand questions or answer questions that follow. But also it's important to understand what the scenario is saying. We have Tomi's induction program. Tomi has developed an induction program for newly appointed employees. They are usually taken on a tour of the premises. They are also introduced to senior management and colleagues. So now, what is the question? Quote two aspects that Tommy included in his induction program. And then advise Tommy on three other aspects that should be included in an induction program for six months. And then discuss the placement procedure. So it's basically what we looked into so far. The solution is one you quote the rules for quoting is you take it as it is from the senior take it as it is so they are usually taken on a tour where did i take this you look tommy has developed an induction program for newly appointed employees is that part and parcel of now uh, the induction program no but then when you look into the other sentence, they are usually taken on a tour of the premises. Yes, that is part and parcel of what? Now, the induction program. One mark for that. You quote as it is. You don't just quote tour of the premises. Of the premises. No, you take. They are usually taken on a tour of the premises. Then you get your one mark. And then you... They are introduced to senior management and colleagues. That's one mark as well. And then that's how you get your two. Remember, when you quote, you take it as it is. We have a follow-up question. The follow-up question now is very tricky because it says, advise Tommy on three other. When they say other, it means you should not include the induction programs that are already on the scenario. This should be excluded because they are saying other. If you include them in the second question or the follow-on question, then you have a problem because we will mark that as repetition. Now, advice to me on other three. Other three is safety, regulations and rules, two marks because it's not on the scenario. Overview of the business, two marks for that. And then discussion of the employment contract and conditions of service, two marks for that. And that's how you get your six. And then we have what now? Here, we don't mark this. Why? It's because the question made it clear that we only want three other aspects. So if you write more than that, and then if you start with them incorrect answers, they will be marked incorrect. But if the two last points here are the most correct, then you will not be marked for that because the question was clear that only three other aspects of induction is what the question is looking for. So that's how you get your six marks. And then the placement procedure, the employer should outline the responsibilities or expectations of the employee's new posi position. Furthermore, the employer should determine the what now? The relationship or similarities between the expectations of the job and the competencies of the new employee. And then another part and parcel of the procedure is to determine the employee's strengths, weaknesses, skills, interests by subjecting him to various psychometric tests. So that's how you get your four marks through the procedure. Remember the procedure will always be four marks or six marks. So you should always know that you need to know all your three points for the placement procedure. So that is how you get your four marks. Then as we proceed, we have another assessment on induction now, 2.1. We have statements now. We had the scenario in the previous assessment. Now we have now uh, statements. State whether the following statements are the purpose or the benefits of induction. 1, 2.1.1. Making the new employees feel welcome by introducing them to their physical workspace. Is that a purpose or a benefit? You should specify 
2.1.2, making the new employee feel at ease in the workplace, which reduces anxiety and insecurity or fear. Is it the purpose or the benefit? And then as we proceed, 2.1.3, communicating information about the products. Is it a purpose or an induction you should indicate and then 2.1.4 reduces the staff turnover as new employees have been inducted properly is that a purpose or a benefit let's see what are your answers now i gave you enough time i gave you enough time the first one 2.1.1 let's see the count of five one two three four five what is the answer the answer should be this is the purpose. The purpose is to make the new employee feel welcome by introducing them in their physical work space. And then the second one, 2.1.2, make the new employee feel at ease in the workplace, which reduces now anxiety. Fear. Now, is that a benefit or a purpose? Let's go through it again. Make the new employee make the new employee feel at ease in the workplace, which will reduce anxiety, insecurity, and fear. With the count of five, let's see. One, two, three, four, five. What is the answer? The answer is the benefit. The benefit here is that the employee will feel at ease. And that will benefit the employee because it will reduce anxiety. It will reduce insecurity and it will reduce fear. So that is the benefit of induction to the business and the employee. Let's see here 2.1.3. Is this a purpose or the benefit? They communicate information about the, the product. Is that the benefit or purpose? Think about it. I think we all know what this is. One, two, three, four, five. The answer is the purpose, obviously, because the purpose is to communicate about the product or service that is being offered when we start the induction so that the employee knows. And then let's see the last sentence. It reduces the staff turnover as the new employees have been inducted properly. Now, they've been inducted properly. So, the staff turnover is reduced. What is staff turnover? Staff turnover is when the business now frequently changes their workers. So, such is not needed because it means the business has to frequently hire. It has to frequently do a recruitment and do the selection activity. So, it is important that the employee just hires workers and they gain experience in a position rather than changing after every month that is not for uh, good for a business so if it reduces the staff turnover then it should be a benefit because it means now the business is not changing their workers frequently so the answer is benefit so that is how you would get your eight marks remember you need to know what is under induction uh, you should know that we have the papers, we have the meaning, we have aspects that should be included and the benefit to say how does the benefit, how does the business benefit from performing the induction program. And then as we look now into another assessment, now we have a scenario. Read the scenario below and answer questions that follow. We have Mpo Beauty Salons, MPS. Tabo as a hairstylist was appointed as a hairstylist at Mpo Beauty Salon. Mpo introduced Tabo to his fellow colleagues and management. She also allowed Tabo to, uh, to an opportunity to ask questions that will put him at ease. And Tabo was offered an in-service training to improve his skills. Now, quote three purposes of induction from the scenario above. And then 3.1.2, explain other purposes of other. Other purposes, this should be key to you. When they say other, it means you exclude everything that would be quoted from the scenario. So, explain other purposes of induction for businesses. Furthermore, 3.1.3, advise Mpo on the benefits of induction for businesses. And then... 3.2, elaborate on the meaning of placement as a recruitment uh, activity of the human resource function. Now, solutions. We go to the scenario again. Remember, you need to quote as it is. Which sentences should we quote? Should we quote Tabo as a hairstylist was appointed at Mpo Beauty Salon? Is that the answer? No, I don't think so. 
and I know you don't think so as well, then Mpo introduced Tabo to his fellow colleagues and management. Now, this is the purpose of induction, is to introduce your new employee to their fellow colleagues. So, this should be the answer. This has to be quoted. Now, you take it during the exam, you quote it. But remember, I'm using the latest technology. This is how I do my quoting. Voila, Mpo introduced Tabo to his fellow colleagues and management. That's one mark. Then number two, she also allowed Tabo to an opportunity to ask what? Questions that would put him at ease. Is that part and parcel of the purpose of induction? Think about it. Yes, when we induct, we allow the new employee to ask questions about things they don't understand or maybe things they see the first time in the business. So that should be quoted. You take it as it is. Remember, well, no, I won't write like you. I won't write like you. I'm using technology. Voila, I quote as it is. She also allowed Tabo an opportunity to ask questions that will put him at ease. So that is correct. Then the last one was Tabo has offered in-service training. Part and parcel of induction is to offer now in-service training. And that's how you get your three marks. Now, let us look into the question first, explain other purposes, excluding the ones we saw in the previous slide or in the previous question where they are saying, quote from the scenario. We don't want anything that was on the scenario. We want other purposes of induction. One, introducing a new employee or colleagues to establish relationships with fellow colleagues at different level. Should we allow that? No, we can't allow that. Why now? Why can't we allow that? Remember, Tabo is introduced to fellow colleagues and management. So that is also, uh, uh, this is a repetition of the fact. So you can be allocated marks for that. And then give new employees tour information about the layout of the building or office. That's two marks for that. And then make the new employee feel welcome by introducing them to their physical workspace. That's two marks for that. And then improve their skills through in service training now let us look into the previous slide in the previous slide the scenario do we have anything about in service training let's see let's see yes tabo was offered an in service training so this would be what now repetition when we go to the 3.1.2 so we cannot allocate marks for this fact because it is a repetition of what already gave you marks in uh, the scenario 3.1.1 question. Then, familiarize the new employee with the organizational structure. That's two marks for that. And that's how you'd get your six. But if you further continue by maybe uh, adding this one to say, allows the new employee to ask questions, which will put them at ease. So this is a repetition because it's on the scenario. Then, advise them upon the benefits of induction. If you now, um, Pop Beauty Saloon, if you now, you have to talk to the question paper so that you enjoy what you are doing, what you are writing. You should talk to say, okay, Mpo, as a business expert, I'm giving you this advice to say the benefits of induction is that your workers now performance will increase. So it increases the quality performance or the productivity. And then, and then another one is that it allows your employees to settle in quickly and work if Effectively, especially because they'll be working in a beauty saloon, so they'll be able to talk to customers nicely because you introduce them in the right way. Furthermore, this will allow you now to ensure that the new employee understand the rules and restrictions in the business. Maybe because you're working in a saloon to say you are not allowed to use the relaxer or two uh, chemicals uh, when you are relaxing uh, someone's hair. So th those are can be the rules. So you are just talking to the content, you are enjoying what you are doing. And then furthermore, the benefits would be now to ensure that the new employee may be able to establish relationships with fellow employees at different levels. So now you 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 know that this would be a benefit because a saloon is very is a, a very small space whereby as the workers you should have a relationship. So this would be a benefit to your worker, Mpo. And then as you proceed, uh, proceed, Mpo, this will 
also be a benefit because employees will be familiar with the structure, who's their supervisor or the low level. So it's a benefit as well because they would know where to report challenges if they're facing one. And then it also allows your workers to feel at ease in the workplace, which will reduce anxiety, fear or uh, insecurity. So that is how you should go about answering these issues. And then elaborate on the meaning of placement as a, an activity of the human resource. Here we are talking about selected candidates being placed where they will function optimally and add value to the business. Furthermore, a specific job is assigned to the selected candidate and then the qualifications, skills or personalities of the selected candidate is being meshed with the requirements of the job. So that is the meaning of now the placement. Now, salary determination. After a worker has been placed, now we talk about mula, money, how the salary is determined, the compensation, the remuneration, piecemeal or time related. This is now salary determination to say, how will the salary be determined? How will the mula be determined? How will the zaga be determined for the workers? So we have two methods. We have the piecemeal and we have the time related. Now, let us see the difference between the two. When the business determines their workers' salary using the piecemeal, this is what we actually mean. Piecemeal workers are paid according to the number of items or units produced or actions performed. Let's say you are running a, 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 a small tech shop where you sell fast food like a quarter. So if you are selling a quarter, I would say my workers would be compensated piecemeal uh, using the piecemeal the salary determination method, meaning for each quarter they have done for their customer, I pay them 10 rand. So that is a, a clear example to say now workers are paid according to the number of items or units produced or action performed. So after they've performed the action of making the quarter or the, uh, the, the action of making the beggar, then they will receive 10 rand from their salary. So after, so it means if they produce maybe 20 quarters or 20 beggars or 20 bunny chows, we know that would say 20 multiplied by 10. So here with piecemeal, a salary is determined according to the action performed by the worker, the units produced by the worker, and that is piecemeal. But with time-related, workers are paid for the amount of time they've spent at work or on a task. So here, the time is the one that will determine the salary that has to be paid. And then as we proceed now, piecemeal, workers are not remunerated, meaning they are not paid for the number of hours worked, regardless of how long it takes them to make the item. But with now time related, workers with the same experience or qualifications are paid on the salary scale, regardless of the amount of work done. And then with uh, time related, they will be paid because of the experience qualification. We don't look into the action performed here. We just look into the issue of time to say they are paid according to a salary scale using hours that they have covered for that particular month or week. But with piecemeal, they are not paid. They are not remunerated. They are not remunerated for the number of hours. So the, the piecemeal is mostly used in factories, particularly in the textile or technology industry, while the time related is used in the private or public sector businesses as a method to determine salary for their workers. So those are the two methods we have. Just know those two, time related and piecemeal. Then as we proceed, we have the link between salary determination and the basic conditions of employment to say, when salary is being determined, there's a link 
with the labor law called the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, which determines the conditions of employment which the contract is based on. So as a human resource manager, remember, you're in charge of the workers. You're in charge of making sure that they are remunerated fairly. So you need to look into the Basic Conditions of Employment Act and how it links with salary determination. One, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act would basically outline legalities such as the employment contract to say there should be an employment contract and then furthermore which will affect the salary determination because these legalities are such uh, for example the number of hours which uh, the workers would be working and how over time should be compensated so those are legalities that are outlined by the basic conditions of employment act and they do link with the salary determination furthermore Payments of salaries should be based on whether the employee is payment or employed on a fixed contract. That is what the basic conditions of employment is saying to say the conditions or the salary determination for a permanent worker cannot be similar to a, a temporary worker or a worker who's hired on a fixed contract. And then the basic conditions of employment sets out conditions like the regulations of working hours, like the overtime like the leave conditions that are there so those are the conditions that are set out by the basic conditions of employment act to say a worker who's working should work at least eight hours to nine hours depending on the number of days they are working so that would ensure that so these uh, basic conditions that are set out would ensure that fair labor and human resource practices are there so that is the link to say even the hours are being determined by the uh, 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 determined by the basic conditions of employment act which implicates the salary determination and according to the basic conditions of employment act businesses may use different remuneration methods to pay their employees so according to the basic conditions of employment act businesses may use different remuneration methods. Remember, we have two. It can use either time-related or the piecemeal. Remember, with time-related, you are paid according to the number of hours, but with piecemeal, you are paid according to the action performed or units performed. And then businesses are supposed to deduct income tax from pay as you earn as employees, uh, from the employees' taxable salaries. So that is the link between salary determination and the basic conditions of employment act to say with salary, before it can be determined, they should look into the act called the basic conditions of employment act because it outlines legalities. It also outlines, uh, it sets out conditions of employment from the number of hours that should be performed by workers to uh, allow fair labor and human resource practices and it also allows a business to choose whether to remunerate their workers using a uh, time related or using piecemeal then as we move now fringe benefits we have examples of fringe benefits what are fringe benefits these are benefits that would be given to workers beyond their salary to say if you are earning 25,000 a business would give you 5,000 benefits more so let us look into examples of those benefits those benefits include the medical aid fund or the health insurance fund it also includes the pension fund it would also include provident fund and the federal benefits and it would also include uh, for people who use their cars frequently for people who travel frequently for people who obviously everyone stays in their house or for people who stay in their cell phones or people who work with maybe looking nice and fashion it would also uh, the business would give them what we call allowances which can be for a car for traveling for a house for cell phone or for clothing furthermore Another French benefit or an example of French benefit can be performance-based incentives. So these are incentives that 
would be given to workers for doing a, 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 a great job. And then issuing of bonus shares as part and parcel of now allowing employees or giving them benefits beyond their salary. Because when a business issues bonus shares, it means now it allows this worker who has been working hard to get now share or ownership in the business by giving them shares, which we call bonus shares. And then staff discounts are part and parcel, uh, they are part and parcel of the fringe benefit because it allows for free or low cost meals as well uh, or canteen fa uh, facilities. So that is your examples of fringe benefits. Now we look into fringe benefits that are required by law, meaning it's compulsory for the business to ensure that they have such a fringe benefit, which is called we call unemployment insurance fund. The employer and the worker each contribute one percent, and the employer must pay now the unemployment insurance fund or contribution of two percent of the value of the each worker's salary per month to say one percent will come from the employer and one percent would come from the uh, worker so together it would be two percent so this fund now is a fringe benefit as well because the business is contributing one percent and the worker is contributing one percent so together it becomes two so the one percent that is contributed by the worker is considered to be a fringe is considered to be beyond the salary and then this fund will also assist the dependents of a contributing worker who has died so that they can be able to go there and claim and then it will also protect or assist a worker who becomes now unemployed so this fund also offers short-term financial assistance to workers when they become unemployed now let's look into the impact of fringe benefits remember with fringe benefits let's say you're aiming to twenty thousand, and then you have your medical aid with your medical aid your your cover the total cover is five thousand, but the business is saying now, since the cover is five thousand, we will pay three thousand on your behalf, and then you pay only two thousand. So three thousand now is part and parcel of your salary. So it becomes a fringe benefit. Is that this three thousand is beyond your salary? Is not ex uh, deducted from your twenty thousand. The only amount that is going to be deducted from your twenty thousand is the two thousand. But the three thousand will come from the business. So that's what we mean with fringe benefits. So that's what we mean now let us look into the impact the positives and negatives to say what are the advantages of these fringe benefits on a business one it improves the productivity resulting in higher profitability why because the workers are receiving more from working for the business they have more benefits so it allows them to work harder for the business furthermore it attracts experienced employees who may positively contribute towards the business goals and objectives why are these workers being attracted is because they want to get these fringe benefits like the three thousand the car allowance the traveling allowance the pension fund they want to get those allowances and then it increases employees satisfaction satisfaction or loyalty as they may be willing to go an extra mile for a business then furthermore businesses save money as the benefits are tax deductible because now the business is giving more to their workers as fringe benefits which would help when it comes to the health of the workers now the business has to pay less tax so that is the advantage i give my workers the benefits they do more products for me and i get high profit as a business two i attract as a business experienced workers who positively contribute towards the goals and objectives Furthermore, it increases the employees now satisfaction and loyalty as they are willing to go an extra mile for this business that is giving them benefits. And then furthermore, the business is able to save money because the benefits are tax deductible. Then, the negatives is that businesses who cannot offer French benefits fail to attract skilled workers. Furthermore, it can create conflict or lead to corruption if allocated unfairly. 
Furthermore, fringe benefits are traditional costs that may result in cash flow problems. So those are the negatives of the fringe benefit. Now, we have the implications of the human resource function. This is the last part of our human resource. To say, as a human resource, you are implicated to know the labor laws. We only focus on four labor laws here that have a direct influence on workers. We have the Labor Relations, we have Employment Equity Act, we have Skills Development Act, and the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. Let's see how these labor laws implicate the business or the human resource manager. One, the labor relations remembers an act that talks about the relationship between the employer and the employee. So it promotes resolutions of labor disputes. One, two, it protects the rights of employees or employers as outlined in the constitution because it gives out the rights of the employers and also outlines the, the rights of employees. Furthermore, it advances economic development or social justice and labor peace. Furthermore, it provides for unresolved disputes to be referred to what now uh, uh, labor court. So remember what is an unresolved dispute? An unresolved dispute is basically when there was a disagreement between the employer and the employee. So if it was not solved within the business because it is unresolved, it can be taken out or referred can be referred to the labor court or the labor appeal court. So it can be referred. So labor relation provides that platform to say unresolved labor disputes can be taken to labor court or labor appeal court. And then it promotes orderly negotiations and employees participation in the decision making in the workplace. So that is labor relations. And as we look into employment equity now, employment equity again ensures that now. Remember, in the process of employing, you should ensure that you employ those who were previously disadvantaged. Hence, we call it employment equity. And give, remember, with previously disadvantaged individuals, we are not talking about Africans. We are not talking about uh, black people only. We are talking about colors. We are talking about Indians. We are talking about females. We are talking about people who with disabilities so in the process of employing employ equally and when now they are employed ensure that if they are working and doing the same duty or responsibility equal pay for work of equal value should be done so they should be paid equally if they are doing the same duty furthermore ensure that affirmative action promotes diversity in the workplace ensure that affirmative what action promotes diversity in the workplace so what do we mean with affirmative action with affirmative action we are saying those who in the process of employing the business should ensure that previously disadvantaged individuals who are suitable and qualified are considered before they can employ anyone they should consider previously disadvantaged individuals so if they do that they're gonna achieve diversity what is diversity Diversity is to ensure that inside a business you have people from different backgrounds culturally when it comes to races, when it comes to ethnic groups, so that diversity is achieved. Remember, South Africa is a diverse country. Then as we proceed, the human resource manager should promote or provide equal opportunities in the workplace. Hence, we call it employment equity. Furthermore, they should retrain, develop, train or designated groups through skills development programs and then also ensure that they define the appointment processes clearly so that people know what is the criteria for one to be employed that should be clear to to ensure that all parties are well informed who are applying for the job and then that is now employment equity ensure that equality is achieved in the process of employing skills development act this is how now a business can be implicated to deal with this act called the Skills Development Act. The business can contribute 1% of their salary bill to the skills development levy. 
Furthermore, they can ensure that training in the workplace is formalized and structured. So this is basically complying with the Skills Development Act. Because if they are contributing 1% of their salary bill, it means they are allowed now to claim again from the sectors if they want to develop the skills of their workers. Remember, that's how the skills development work. You contribute 1% in order for you to later on say, I want to train my workers, so now I want to claim the grant so that I can train my workers as an employer. And then it ensures that training in the workplace is formalized and structured. Furthermore, appoint a full, it allows for business to appoint a full or part-time consultant as a skills development facilitator. And it allows now to assist managers in identifying skills or training needs to help them introduce learnerships. So that is the human resource manager. That is how they would be uh, implicated. They have to ensure that the business pays 1%. They have to ensure that training in the workplace is formalized. They have to ensure that if they are allowed, they appoint a full or part-time consultant as a skills development facilitator to be the overseer of the training that is taking place inside the business. Basically, they'll be managing and monitoring if workers are trained properly and then they assist managers in identifying skills or training needs that would help to introduce learnerships. So that is Skills Development Act and how a human resource manager would be implicated. Basic Conditions of Employment Act. This is basically going back to complying to the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. One, the human resource manager should know that workers must receive double if they work during public holidays or Sundays, meaning double their normal rate if the rate is 100 rand, and then they have to get double the 100 rand to 200 if now they are to work during holidays or public uh, public holidays or Sundays. And furthermore, they must know that workers must at least have a break of 60 minutes after five hours of continuous work. And then businesses should not employ children under the age of 16. And then workers must take up to six weeks paid sick leave during the 36 month cycle. So this is what now the human resource manager should know and should allow their workers to have. And then when we look into uh, the implication when it comes to the basic conditions, this is regarding the working hours. Now, workers should only work nine hours per day in a five day work week and then eight hours per day in a six day work week and overtime should not exceed 10 hours per week so basically those would be the conditions they move from waking hours or, or, or regulations of waking hours to now the, the sick leave or types of leave and then it also looks into uh, term, the prohibition of child labor to say you cannot hire a child under the age of 16 and then it looks to meal breaks and as periods and also looks into public holidays and waking on Sunday to say how should it be remunerated. Assessment. Uh, we have question one. It says name four examples of employees' fringe benefits. And number two, read the scenario below and answer questions that follow. Uh, we have smart construction with Gail and Chris. So Gail and Chris are employees of smart construction. Gail is remunerated according to the number of hours spent at work and increase according to the number of houses built. Gail's employment contract has recently been terminated due to regular absence from work. 2.1. Identify the salary determination methods of remuneration uh, applicable to Gail and Chris and motivate your answer by quoting from the scenario above. And then question three, discuss the implications of Employment Equity Act on human resource function. Now, number one, four now examples of employees' fringe benefits. Let's see the solutions. Remember, we talked about what are the benefits. One, medical aid fund or health insurance fund. We also have pension fund as a fringe benefit. We have provident fund as well. We also have funeral benefits. We can also have car traveling, housing, cell phone, or floating allowance. Cut against 
providing such because sometimes this question can come let's say this is your is your script so in your script you can say one do not answer this way don't say car then bullet number two you say traveling travel then you say housing all this will be considered to be one mark because you are basically outlining the allowances so this will be considered to be one big tick which will only give you one mark so guard against that furthermore performance based incentives issuing of bonus shares staff discounts or free or low cost meals or canteen facilities so that is your four french benefits one two three four and that's how you get your four we move to the scenario now read the scenario below and answer questions that follow smart construction has gail and chris were employees of smart construction gail is remunerated according to the number of hours spent at work and chris according to the number of houses built Gray's employment contract has recently been terminated due to regular absence what is the question saying identify the two salary determination methods you need to be clear some sentences are just to inform you what the construction company does. Their workers is Gail and Chris. They're employees of Smart Construction. That's it. And then when we look into the second sentence, Gail is remunerated according to the number of hours spent at work. Now, that's where you'd get your answer because the question is saying, identify the salary determination methods of remuneration applicable to Gail and Chris. So you need to know how Gail is getting remunerated and how Chris is getting remunerated. So according to the scenario, Gail is being remunerated according to the number of hours spent at work, while Chris is remunerated according to the number of houses built. So that, that's where you get your answers. But the last statement or sentence says, Gail's employment contract has recently been terminated due to regular absence from work. So this now is just to make sure that you, you lose concentration if you haven't studied. But then the, the answers are on your second sentence, which emphasizes that Gail is being paid according to the number of hours, Chris according to the number of houses. So let's see, time related, correct, because Gail is paid according to the number of hours, piecemeal is because Chris is paid according to the number of what? Houses. Remember, even if the salary determination if the, 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 the salary determination method is incorrect, is incorrect, if it is incorrect, then you will not be awarded marks for the motivation. Let's be clear. The motivation will not be if the salary determination is incorrect. So that's how you get your six. Implication of the Employment Equity Act on Human Resources is what? Equal pay for work of equal value. The human resource manager should know that. Furthermore, ensure that they apply affirmative action, which promotes diversity in the workplace by hiring those who were previously disadvantaged if they are suitable and qualified. The human resource manager must promote or provide equal opportunities in the workplace to show that there is equity there. Furthermore, they should ensure that those who are previously disadvantaged, if they don't have the skills, they are being retrained, developed, trained, uh, the designated groups through skills development programs so that now you lose the gap of inequality of skills. Now we are looking into inequality of skills, not skills development. Then define the appointment processes clearly to ensure that all parties are well informed. Then we have another question now, assessment 1.1. Read the scenario below and answer the questions that follow. These are your typical exam questions. We have now a vacancy in financial management. That's the scenario we have to read. Now we have a job title, qualification, experience, key performance areas, total package and others. What is the job title? The job title is for a municipal financial manager. The qualifications is for a BCom degree is needed for one to qualify and then at at least six years financial management at middle level and then prepare budgets and be able to manage incomes and expenses. And then the total package is three 
153,920 per annum and then others include pension, medical aid fund and the housing subsidy. Now 1.1.1 identify two examples of job description and two examples of job specification in the advert above. Then 1.1.2 give two examples of fringe benefit in the scenario above and evaluate the impact of the fringe benefit on businesses. Then distinguish between piecemeal and the time related methods of salary determination. Now let us look into our solutions. The scenario again, here we are looking into recruitment again. When you look into recruitment, they are saying identify two examples of job description and two examples of job specification in the advertisement above. So we have now job description, which can be preparing what? Budgets. Yes, that's a job description. Remember, job description is the duties and responsibilities. The duties of the financial manager would be to prepare budgets, one, and also to manage income and expenses for the municipality. So that's how you get the first two. And then what would make one to qualify for this vacant position is to have a BCom degree and at least a six years financial management at a middle level that's zero two as well and then you get your four marks then question two you need to you need the scenario again because it says give two examples of fringe benefit in the scenario hence i'm bringing the scenario again so two examples what are the two examples there we have what pension fund yes it's from the scenario Two is the medical aid is also from the scenario and we have the housing subsidy which is also from the scenario so that's how you get your two marks then evaluate the impact now what are the positives if these employees are receiving pension fund the housing subsidy what is the benefit to the business one these employees would be productive and they would increase their performance which will result to higher profitability for the business furthermore the business will attract experienced what workers or employees who will positively contribute towards the objectives of the business another advantage is that it will increase employees satisfaction or loyalty because they are willing to go an extra mile for the business and then the business will save money for the what for the benefits as their tax deductible however negatives we can look into is the idea that businesses who cannot offer these fringe benefits will not attract skilled workers it can create conflict or lead to corruption if allocated unfairly and then fringe benefits are an additional cost that may result in cash flow problems so the total mark there is eight and with the question it guides us to say evaluate the impact remember what say when it says evaluate the impact we're looking into both positives and negatives both what positives and what negatives so you're allowed to provide positives only or negatives only or you're allowed to provide both positives or negatives combined two positives two negatives three positives one negatives three positives one positive you are allowed as long as the question says evaluate the impact so two marks for that two marks for that two marks for that and two marks for everything until we get to eight distinguish now the difference between piecemeal and salary determination workers with piecemeal are paid according to the number of items produced or action performed while time related Workers are paid for the amount of time they spend at work or on a task. And then when with piecemeal, workers are not remunerated or paid for the number of hours worked, regardless of how long it takes for them to complete the item or task. However, with time-related workers with the same experience qualifications are paid on a salary scale, regardless of how the amount of work is done. And then mostly it is used in factories particularly in the textile or technological industry while many private and public sector businesses use this method so this is basically examples of businesses that use the time related and businesses that use the uh, piecemeal so that is how you'd get your four marks 
Now we have an essay, typical essay question. This is your typical essay question. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to come, but it's just a typical essay question. You have a preamble there, statement, which just gives you uh, an outline about maybe a business which is facing a challenge, but then um, you cannot use anything on the preamble to answer the essay. Yakima Enterprise has opened a new manufacturing department and the other day, their human resource manager followed a recruitment procedure before advertising the vacancy and then successful candidates were inducted and attractive fringe benefits were offered. Yakima also implemented the salary determination method to pay successful uh, candidates. Now, the instruction is write an essay on the following human resource activities in which we include the following aspects. Uh, one, you have to outline the aspects that must be included in an induction program. Two, explain the recruitment procedure that Yakima Enterprise has followed and also discuss the two salary determination methods and advise Yakima Enterprise on the impact of fringe benefits that uh, a shop and go uh, enterprise. And then, now, this is how your essay should be structured. One, you should have introduction, the first subheading, the second subheading, the third, the fourth, and the fifth subheading. So, this is how you should structure your essay. And remember, this is compulsory introduction. This is compulsory conclusion. So, this would give you... And for instance, if you have provided, let's say this is how you have answered your essay. You didn't write anything, but you just provided this structure. You would get an A. You would get one mark for just providing this. Because when we do the flasso, which is how we mark an essay with uh, business studies essay, we mark using the flasso as a criteria. You would get zero, zero for intro, but zero, one for providing all the subheadings. So already you have you have one mark without any responses. But then let us see if now you have fully responded to an essay. Remember, your introduction should be based, or your conclusion, both your intro and conclusion, should be based on these subheadings. One, the induction program. Two, the recruitment procedure. Three, the salary determination. Four, the what? The impact of fringe benefit. This is what your uh, introduction and conclusion should be based on. Refrain from introducing your essay and saying this essay, this essay is about this essay is about induction. This essay is about, this is wrong. This is not allowed. This is not an English essay. This is a business studies essay. So you should use a point to say okay, maybe outline aspects of the induction. Take one aspect of the induction program. Maybe take introducing to new colleagues as your introduction. Maybe take the recruitment procedure to say human resource manager has to prepare a job analysis, which includes the job specification. Then you introduce your essay using that point, not saying this essay is about, we know what the essay is about. The essay is about the induction program. The essay is about the recruitment procedures, about the salary determination. So do not tell us or repeat that we know that take one of the points in your induction program one of the points in your uh, recruitment one of your points in your uh, salary determination or the impact then let's see the actual uh, essay this is how you should approach it what introduction you see you check this point it makes the new employee makes the new employee feel welcome by introducing them to their physical workspace now this is what what should be included in the induction program? One mark for that. And then 3.2 is another subheading. Remember, you need to skip a line in your answer sheet. Skip a line. Then outline aspects that should be included in the induction program. These can include introducing key people to their immediate colleagues. Furthermore, safety regulations and rules. Furthermore, overview of the business. Furthermore, tour of the premises. So that is your first subheading. Two marks, two marks, two marks, and two marks. Furthermore, we move to the second subheading. Before we do it, we skip a line so that your work is neat and very clear. Explain the recruitment procedure. 
One, the human resource manager should prepare the job analysis that includes the job specification in order to identify the recruitment needs. Furthermore, they should choose the method of recruitment, e.g. it can be internal or external, to reach the suitable applicant. Another recruitment proce procedure, vacancies can internally be advertised via the staff notice board. And then another one is that if internal recruitment is an, a successful, external recruitment should be considered. So that is your recruitment procedure. That is your recruitment procedure. And you get eight for that. Already you have eight here and you have one here. And remember, introduction, you need to introduce using two points for you to get the two maximum marks. And then there's... The difference between salary determination methods, two marks for piecemeal, two marks, because piecemeal paid according to the number of items here, with time related, you are paid according to the time you spend on a work or task. Then piecemeal workers are not remunerated for work, not remunerated for the number of hours worked, regardless of how long it took them to complete the item or task, and then here, Workers with the same experience qualifications are paid on a salary scale regardless of the work done. So that is eight. Then the impact of fringe benefits on your Akima enterprise, it improves productivity and which will also result in higher profitability. It attracts experienced employees who may uh, positively contribute to the business goals or objectives. And then the businesses who cannot offer these fringe benefits will fail to attract skilled workers and it creates conflict or lead to corruption if allocated and fail. So you see, this is a mix of positives and negatives so you get your eight marks again and then the conclusion it increases employee satisfaction or loyalty as it may uh, employees may go or are willing to go an extra mile that's two marks for conclusion now this was supposed to be on the impact but i took it and placed it under conclusion because i don't want to see you saying conclusion now is about what say the essay was about no you use the point that is on your subheadings but remember you cannot repeat effect if you have placed it under the impact you cannot place it under the conclusion it would be considered to be repetition you'll get an r so when we mark your essay now because it is full now we will use what flasso with the first subheading you got one with the uh, second one and we check the subheadings how many subheadings do you have you have all the subheadings you get an a and then we mark your essay if you have 16 marks and above then you receive the second a because with this essay this learner received 16 marks and above you see 16 17 there 17 plus 8 we have your 25 25 plus 8 again we have more than 32 so the learner got 32 max maximum then does the learner have introduction yes the learner has introduction as and has tried to introduce let's see we need to see that yes the learner has an introduction if you have provided the introduction as a heading but you have not tried to write an introduction or to introduce your essay you will not receive this l because it shows that you did not try to attempt to write an introduction so you will not get this l because this l represents now one mark for trying to introduce but it will only be allocated if there's something under your introduction then we move does the learner have conclusion yes the learner does have conclusion you give you an l because you have tried to answer the conclusion we see the point there that's how you get your two a is the first a is for all the subheadings the second one is for making sure that you have received 16 marks and above then you get the two and then when we look into synthesis we're looking into the relevance of the essay to say how many subheadings do you have and then do we have 50 percent or more of these subheadings being correct if they are correct then you get your two then if we have one correct and then all the subheadings are incorrect or are ir irrelevant then we start considering the issue of minusing marks but 
because the essay is relevant you can be incorrect you will be considered for marks but if now you are not relevant the essay question was asking about the impact of what fringe benefits and you give the impact of uh, creative thinking that is irrelevancy now to the question so that is now two marks for that originality is about giving an example that was not researched maybe you can say here yeah, with french benefits you can say for instance uh, uh, kfc has their workers uh, working so hard because now they are given french benefits such as free lunch so that is an example that might be researched so you get two for that and that's how you get your 40 for your essay so that would be the end of our lesson. Let us look into aspects we dealt with. We looked into the human resource activities. The first one is recruitment. We looked into selection, induction. We also looked into the placement. We looked into salary determination. We looked into fringe benefits and we looked into legislation. So that is the end of our lesson. Thank you for being with us during this wonderful lesson.